I love to bike around Savannah. And thanks to our famously designed Oglethorpe plan in a very predictable grid, I can take my time meandering. And as I observe my surroundings, I am continually struck by the stark disparity between some of our neighborhoods. How 38th Street has teeny tiny houses right up on the street and no sidewalks. And 44th Street has grand houses set far back and sidewalks that line both sides of the street. Have you ever wondered why? With my career being in historic preservation, I pay attention to these things. I examine a lot of historic maps, photographs, and documents to understand how a place changed over time. And now, as a small-scale developer, like many others, I'm searching for solutions to Savannah's affordable housing crisis and racial wealth gap. And we will never have adequate solutions to those problems if we don't examine the past, and particularly how past land use policies directly caused systemic inequities in our built environment and how we're still letting it happen. Starting in 1934, as part of New Deal legislation, Congress created the Homeowners Loan Corporation to help shore up the housing market. And to aid in this work, residential security maps were created for over 200 American cities that graded neighborhoods based on their investment risk. That perceived risk was the convergence of races. Those in power at the time felt that the infiltration of non-white races lowered property values and that loans to those areas were not economically sound. You can click through these maps online at the National Archives to see Syracuse. Charlotte, and Phoenix. And these maps were accompanied by pages and pages of detailed survey descriptions written about those areas on the maps. One from Cleveland reads, the apparent future for this area will be an increasing occupancy ratio by Jewish, Italian, and colored with a steady fall in price value. This grading system solidified many discriminatory practices already in play. Most aspects of American society were segregated at this time. Schools, parks, transportation. These maps legalized racism in real estate at the federal level, and their reverberating influence reshaped residential building form across the country. This practice of denying loans based off where someone lived and the color of their skin was later called redlining after those highest risk red areas. Here is the map produced in the 1930s for Savannah. And in looking at this map, you, like me, may be wondering why grown white men got out colored pencils and drew on maps to enforce a racial hierarchy. How was this allowed? This was because of two Supreme Court cases in years prior that enabled this to happen. In 1917, in Buchanan v. Worley, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled cities could not outright zone this area is for white people and this area is for black people. But if you linked it to public welfare, you were good. Then in 1926, in Euclid, Ohio versus Ambler Realty Company, the Supreme Court further agreed that local zoning ordinances, a relatively new concept at this time, were valid for advancing public welfare. So cities could dictate no industrial next to residential. So given that, these maps were written in very technical, methodical language so that it appeared to benefit the public. And they work like this. In green areas of the map, white property ownership in single-family homes was prioritized with good loan terms. Meanwhile, many black and minority neighborhoods faced discrimination in the form of higher interest rates, larger down payments, or denial altogether. And those ones were labeled red often. Savannah's redlining map is actually unique in that we had several historically black neighborhoods here in Savannah that were actually not redlined. Carver Heights and Kyler Brownville, were, it's written into the descriptions that they were upgraded at the behest of local advocates who lobbied here on their behalf. Author Robert Nelson said that this change of grade for the Negro perspective is the only known instance written into those 200 descriptions of those American cities. Carver Heights was upgraded from red to yellow, and Kyler Brownville was labeled green, and the description called the inhabitants the best class of Negro homeowner. I, for one, am interested to find out who those advocates were who spoke up at this time. But Savannah's map is also very common in the form of discrimination, and the reasons for why 38th Street and 44th Street look so different today become very clear. 
It's written into our descriptions that 38th Street, between Waters Avenue to the east and Reynolds Street to the west, is called out as being inhabited by a few best-class Negroes. 44th Street, meanwhile, is labeled green, and the description called Artsy Park Chatham Crescent, the most desirable white residential property in the city and highly restricted as to race and type of construction permitted, single family with a few duplexes. These restrictions they're talking about are racial deed restrictions, which stated on the property deed that this property could not be sold to a non-white owner. It's a very popular and legal way at this time of enforcing discrimination in property ownership. So as you can see, between these redlining maps, racial deed restrictions, and zoning, the opportunities for people of color were severely restricted. Even when people of color were able to own their own home, it was often in redlined areas and undervalued. Author Andre Perry quantified that the devaluing of black homes has robbed black families of a cumulative $156 billion in wealth. Think of what they could have done with that equity. Now, racial deed restrictions and redlining were finally outlawed in the 1968 Fair Housing Act. But this third component of zoning, particularly our single-family zoning, is where we today continue to cement systemic inequities in our built environment. Savannah's current zoning code looks like this. We just updated it in 2019. It's crazy looking, I know, lots of squiggly lines. And those lines dictate what can be built where and what uses it can have. And these golden areas that I've highlighted represent single-family-only zones. And if I zoomed out, this represents huge portions of our close-to-downtown, nearby-to-transit, highly desirable neighborhoods that you and I probably live in. And when we overlay that 1934 redlining map on top of our zoning, there is a clear overlap. Nearly 100 years later, areas of town where white property ownership was prioritized in the past, like Artsley Park, remain largely unchanged. It's still zoned single-family. In fact, those few duplexes mentioned in the descriptions cannot be built today because our zoning is so exclusive. Meanwhile, redlined areas of town, like Savannah's Yamacraw neighborhood, were later demolished in the 1940s in the name of the public good, and the residents of Savannah's oldest black neighborhood were offered government-owned rental units instead. These impacts of redlining continue to haunt us. In 2021, the Savannah Racial Justice Task Force found that 30% of households of color in Savannah have a net worth of zero. Housing Savannah just identified that we have a deficit, 10,000 housing units, and we were just ranked the ninth least affordable city in the U.S. for renters by CashNet USA. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we need single-family zoning for? Who do we think we're protecting? And do we really still think that the convergence of races, incomes, and uses is a threat to our property values and public welfare? To change our trajectory, First, we have to name these unjust policies and call awareness to the role that they played in putting people of color in these vulnerable positions. Then we need to have community conversations to hear from those families that were impacted by redlining. Only then will we craft community-minded solutions to our affordable housing crisis and racial wealth gap. And second, we need to empower the next generation to take an active role in changing the direction of their neighborhood. Instead of walking by that vacant building or vacant lot and thinking, man, I wish that was something cool, I encourage you to take action. In 2022, I partnered with a friend and I bought this vacant building down the street from my house on Waters Avenue. And we got it fixed up. And now, it's home to three new businesses. If I can be a developer in my neighborhood bringing positive change, then so can you. And third, we need to eliminate our single-family zoning policies, which are the remnants of white supremacy in the built environment. Just like those advocates who spoke up for Carver Heights and Kyler Brownville in the 1930s, we need you to speak to your elected officials, mayor, alderman, county council, and demand policies that provide housing opportunities at all price points, sizes, and locations. And we also just can't rely on new construction to fill our housing gap. 
We don't need to demolish these little houses on 38th Street. We need to save every one to preserve our scarce housing and tell the story that they represent. Savannah was a very intentionally designed city with mixed uses, and we let inequitable forces pull us away from that. If we honestly believe in racial equality, we can no longer let the notion that mixed use, mixed race, mixed income neighborhoods are to be avoided. Instead, we must fight for that convergence in our neighborhoods to create a diverse community where everyone has the opportunity to flourish.